Today I wanna to speak about something I think we all struggle with, and that is suffering. And I wanna just encourage you today. I wanna to give you courage. Encouragement is basically courage to continue. And I wanna give you encouragement today not to throw the towel in in the midst of a trial. And if you're here with us today, you're probably saying, hey, that's me. I'm, I'm struggling right now, right? Like I'm going through a trial. I'm in a season of difficulty. Or maybe you're just coming out of a season of difficulty. When you look at suffering, honestly, just, just take, take a step back. It, when you look at suffering, do you see it as something good or as something that's bad? Honestly, normally bad. We're like, man, that's the last thing we wanna do is suffer. What I wanna show you today is the half-brother of Jesus, James, actually says this, and we believe he's telling the truth, obviously. He says, count it all what? Joy when you face trials of many kind. How in the world can he say with a straight face, count it all joy? What I wanna show you today in our time together from the words of Jesus is I wanna give you a theology of suffering. And I wanna show you from a biblical perspective using the church of Smyrna, how Jesus encourages those believers, hang in there, don't throw in the towel, persevere, it's worth it. If you have a Bible, uh, turn with me to Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter two, I'll tell you a funny story. I was getting ready to preach and I leaned over to Candy and I said, hey, I, I decided to change up my all black attire wardrobe on Sunday and wear blue today. To which my wife said, well, it's Valentine's Day, you should have wore red. But anyway, so <laughs> I'm trying, guys. I'm try I, mean, I got two colors, blue and black in my closet. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 And I'm colorblind, it's a true story. So sometimes if it's like a tricky color, I got to hold, hold it up to candy. She's like, no, put that back. But anyway, anybody with me? Okay. One, of us, one guy in the back, yeah. Okay, here we go, first eight. Here we go. Right to the angel of the church. If you're there, say word, by the way. Say word, okay. Uh, the word of the Lord. Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last. And I taught you this last week. If you weren't here, go back uh, and listen to it. I, I showed you how there's a five-fold process, a formula that John uses. And it's always the same. It's a word from Jesus. And it's a word about their circumstance, situation, secondly. This, thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came back to life. Jesus says, I know your affliction and your poverty. That word is tribulation, by the way. I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are actually a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will experience affliction for 10 years days, but be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who hears or has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. The word of the Lord. Let me pray as we, as we begin. Father, we need wisdom as every week uh, before us, we, we need insight and illumination from your spirit. We know we can't discern the things of the Bible without spiritual discernment. And so, God, we pray for that now. We also pray, God, for the person in here who is hanging on by a thread. I'm praying for the marriage that is on the rocks and not what it was years before. I'm praying for the addict who's wondering if there'll ever be sobriety. I'm praying for the person who feels left alone and isolated in the midst of this trial that they're facing. And I'm praying, God, for encouragement today by your spirit for our people. Whether in person or online or in the chapel, God, we pray today you speak to us. We're listening. Give us ears to hear, we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Jesus is gonna teach us three things, three insights about suffering. Right out the gate, here's what he says. Jesus is showing us he knows, he is keenly aware of our present suffering. And notice what he says, I know, like I know about what's happening there. Now, before we get into the text, let me just give you a little bit of background on Smyrna. Unfortunately, no pictures this week because th there's not a lot left. There are a few ruins, 
But back in the day, Smyrna was one of the most beautiful cities in all of Asia Minor. In fact, it was called the, the, the city of crowns or uh, the crowning jewel of Asia Minor. Uh, it was called the flower of Asia. Uh, a lot of people were born there, particularly writers and poets. You may remember one, his name was Homer. He wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Homer, who remembers that from school, right? So you remember that guy. Uh, in addition to that, one of the greatest bishops uh, of all of the early church, Polycarp, was residing in Smyrna. He was a disciple of John the Apostle who wrote uh, Revelation. And here's how Jesus begins to the church. He says this, with empathy, here's what he says. I know your affliction and I know your poverty, but you're rich. Now that doesn't make any sense because normally when you're poor, you're poor, right? But he says, no, you're actually rich. He says, but I know the slander of some of those in the town who, who are saying they're Jews, but they're actually of the synagogue of what? Satan, now calm down, Jesus, hold on. <laughs> That's not politically correct today. But Jesus says it like it is, right? Don't be afraid, here's what he says, of what you are about to suffer. Now think for a moment, why in the world would Jesus begin there to a group of people who are suffering, who are poor, who are afflicted? Here's why. Because didn't Jesus live the same lifestyle on earth? Did Jesus have money or was Jesus rich when he was on earth? No, he lived poor by the world's standards. Was Jesus tried by the people he came to save? Was Jesus afflicted for doing a good thing? Yes, all of these things. And so right out the gate, here's what's cool about Jesus. Unlike Muhammad, unlike Buddha, unlike Hare Krishna, unlike any other religious figure of the world, we don't serve a God who is outside of our suffering. We serve a God who's in the middle, right? We learned this. Not on the fringe, not on the outskirts. He's in the middle of our suffering. He's in the middle of our church. He's in the middle of this worship service. He should be in the middle of our life, right? And here's what he says. I know your affliction. I told you that word means tribulation. And the word tribulation doesn't just mean, get this, pressure, although it does. It's actually the Greek word that means constant pressure. It's the word picture of a stone being thrown on top of a person and then increasingly smothering them, pressing them down. So here's what was happening. There was a local synagogue of Jewish people who were basically pressuring and attacking the believers for saying that Jesus was the Messiah. And we have to back up so I can give you the context. Rome at this time had decided to grant the Jews in a, in a sense, an exclusion from worshiping false gods. So here's what they said. If you were Jewish by birth, you did not have to go to a temple, you did not have to take incense, and you did not have to confess and worship that Caesar is Lord. So in a sense, you were protected. The problem came in when Jewish believers in God became Christians in Messiah Jesus. And so they couldn't differentiate between, wait, are you a Jew or are you a Christian? And there was a lot of crossover. And so the Jews started to fear that the Romans were gonna take away that privilege. So what do they do? They're like, hey, these guys are no good. You need to attack them. And so we started to see them ostracized, okay? Out of fear, the Jews said, hey, take them people out so you don't mess up. A lot, a lot of power and a lot of greed there. So what happened? The Jewish Christians, and really Christians in general, because it was all the group, they could not purchase food from the farms any longer. They could not go to the market and buy essentials or goods that they needed. They could not even find a job or hold a job, so they were in utter poverty at the time. So what Jesus says is, those people who are Jews from that synagogue doing this to you, they're actually a synagogue of Satan. It's pretty strong words, right? Now, let me just correct some faulty theology. I read it, I'm studying this week, and it's amazing how many people take this and get here. Jesus is not, listen to me, Jesus is not saying that the Jewish people as a whole are of Satan. Okay, you need to understand this. It doesn't make any sense. God all through the Old Testament says, I have an irrevocable covenant with the nation of Israel. They're his people, right? And obviously we'll see how they come into the end times, but God doesn't revoke his covenant. So what is he saying? It's the same thing Jesus said to Peter. Remember that time there at Caesarea Philippi and Jesus is talking about death. He's like, hey guys, I'm about to die. And Peter's like, oh, 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 oh God. And he says, hey, Jesus, man, boss. 
I know you have to talk about death, but man, you're really discouraging the guys back there. Let, let's kind of simmer down all this. Remember what he said? Let's, let's simmer down all this stuff. And Jesus says, get behind, remember this? Get behind me what? Satan. Satan. Now, here's the question. Is Peter Satan? No, he's not Satan. What he's doing is, get this, he's acting and carrying out the plan of Satan, which is to thwart the plan of God. Same thing with these Jews. These Jews were not Satan. They were carrying out the plan of Satan to pressure the Christians of God. Now, what's crazy about this text is what we expect Jesus to say is this. Hey, listen, I know you guys are suffering, but hang in there. It's about to get easy. That's what we expect, right? Hey, I know the pressure. I see it. I know you're being attacked by these Jewish believers who are members of the synagogue, but listen, hang in there. I'm about to step in and remove it and rescue you. That's what we want him to say. Watch what he says. Watch this. He says, I know what's happening, but don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Here's what he's saying. You need to strap, you need to strap your spiritual seatbelt in, boys, because it's about, girls, listen, it's about to be ramped up. It's about to be worse, but look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. D do you know, look at me, pain and affliction are the best teachers in your life. Did you know this? Why? Because pain and affliction expose a weakness that needs to be strengthened. And I'm trying to think of the best example this week, and, and the best one I got is working out, okay? If anybody's ever tried to work out to lose weight or gain muscle, you know this well. And, and, and I didn't know this prior to my time of moving to Mobile, Alabama. I'm gonna share my testimony the week after Easter in its entirety. So you can mark it on the calendar. If you know anybody struggling with drugs or alcohol, prescription pills, heroin, cocaine, uh, it, really any addiction, and they've lost hope, or a family member or friend, just encourage you, bring them here. Maybe they hear my story and say, man, and it's not to glamorize me, but to elevate the Lord Jesus. Say, well, if God can save Robbie, God can save me, amen? And so that's the week after uh, Easter. But after I, got, uh, after I went to rehab the first time, the doctor told me, which he tells a lot of people, you need to change people, places, and things. You have to remove yourself from the environment that tempted you, and you have to move out of town. New Orleans was a pretty tempting city, if you can imagine. And so what did I do? I moved to the only place I knew someone out of town, which was my sister, Lori. She lived in Mobile, Alabama. She was going to the USA College, and uh, she lived in a one-room dormitory in Mobile, Alabama. And here's the, the irony, the, the, the ha-ha, the Lord, is that I went from, quote, this drug life of of fast-paced life and all these amenities and all these things, this swagger, and now I find myself after rehab living on a blow-up mattress and a one-room dormitory apartment. God has a way of humbling you, amen? Anybody with me? I mean, that's what he did. And so I tried to find a job, and the only place I could find a job was the powerhouse gym in, in Mobile, Alabama. It was a really cool job because it was uh, selling memberships and training people, and there was a big college contingency there. And so I started, to, I knew a little bit about working out, but once I started training, I really started studying how to grow muscle and lose fat. And here's what I found out, and I wanna give this to you. This is what I found out. And, and you probably know this, most of you probably don't, but here, here it is. The only way to build muscle, the only way, is by tearing the existing muscle. That's the only way. That's the only way. So you actually have to tear the muscle. You have to make the muscle suffer. You have to break the muscle down before the muscle can be built back up. And so I would go to the gym with Candy or the boys when we go on vacation and would work out in the gym. And, and listen, this is not against any of you, but this is what I would say. I would say, I would say, Rig and Ryder, 85% of the people in this gym could just go home and watch TV because they're not doing anything. You ever see the guys like that? You ever see guys like this? You know, you know, and I, I said, boy, these guys, and, and you feel, and listen, if you love that, you feel good, praise God. But here's the point. Teach, I'm, te I'm, te te I'm trying to teach you something. Try to teach something, right? Here's the point. 
you have to not, see, here's the problem. You have to not only get to the point of suffering, which is what hurts, but you actually, to build muscle, you have to tear the muscle to go through the point of suffering so that the muscle grows stronger in order to resist the stress down the road. Does that make sense? So you have to tear the muscle, come in close. Suffering in your life is the exact same way. See, here's the challenge for a lot of us. Many of us tap out the moment we experience a trial. Right after you start to be faithful in your giving to the Lord, you ever been here before? Then your finances are pressured like never before. And you're like, you know what? It's too hard, I'm out, not gonna give anymore. Young students, uh, young people, you go to school as a student, college student, high school, and you start sharing the gospel after you're radically saved. You're like, man, Jesus changed. And somebody said, would you just be quiet? We don't wanna hear it. You're like, yeah, you know, I don't wanna do that anymore. The moment you start serving the Lord and the moment you start putting your faith in Christ and then you're like, man, I'm really in this thing, I'm following Jesus. And then you get a diagnosis or, or a cancer thing from a doctor or you get sick and you're like, you know what, man, uh, I'm out. God's sovereignty is not real because obviously, and that's what happens, right? But let me remind you, didn't you pray prior to that, watch this, for God to use you? Didn't you pray after becoming a believer for God to strengthen your faith? Didn't you pray for God to advance his kingdom through your life, right? Maybe, did you ever think about this? Maybe, coming close, your present suffering is the answer to your prayer request. What do I mean? See, here's what suffering does. Suffering drives us to dependence upon God by exposing our weaknesses. And by exposing our weaknesses, it fortifies our faith. This is how I believe Paul can say, I can do all things through who? Through Christ who strengthens me, why? Because I know from personal experience, because I have been through the crucible of trials in life and I have emerged victorious on the other side. Let me say it this way, and I know this will resonate. I don't know all of you, but I know some of you, but I know myself. Every significant life altering experience that has shaped your life has been birthed out of a struggle. Think about it. Let me say it another way. Your pain markers are actually the growth milestones of your life. Anybody been to that? If I would say, what changed you as a brother? What changed you as a sister? You would say, was losing a child. It was losing everything we owned in Hurricane Katrina. It was going through recovery and getting through the other side. It's those pain markers that lead to growth milestones that have made you the stronger person that you are today, which leads to the second point, watch this. Not only is Jesus using suffering in our life and knows where we are, watch this. He allows suffering, number two, to strengthen our faith, to strengthen us. Allows is a strong word. Notice what Jesus doesn't promise. He doesn't promise it's gonna be removed, right? Jesus actually says, listen, you better buckle up because it's gonna get worse. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you and you will experience tribulation, affliction for 10 days. And so we have to ask the question here, and you probably wonder, why are they suffering to begin with, right? Like what do they do wrong? What, what sin is in the church that they're suffering because of? The answer is nothing. Unlike Ephesus, if you study the history of Smyrna and from this context, this is one of the only two churches in all of the seven where Jesus doesn't correct them for something. It's also one of the only two churches, you're gonna love this, that is actually still in existence today as a church. There's a church still in Smyrna today. And so we deduce from that something pretty unbelievable. They are suffering not for sin, but for doing a good thing for God. You're probably saying, really? Do you remember the first time you surrendered your life to Christ back in maybe as a child or as an adult, when you, when you really surrendered your life to Christ, you were born again, you got saved, remember this? And then after that, for me, I thought, man, this is gonna be awesome. Everything's gonna be easy. 
It's going to be honky dory. It's going to be copacet. Man, it's going to be easy. And then all Hades breaks loose. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, wait a minute. I thought the Christian life was easy. What just happened, right? And the reason it became difficult for some of you, I'm not trying to scare you, but that's the reality. Anybody know what I'm talking about? By the way, I saw one hand, but okay, three of us. Okay, for me, <laughs> it happened like that. Here's why. Let me explain to you spiritually what happened. The moment you get saved, you switch teams, right? You're drafted by Team Jesus from the domain of darkness in which you were a child of wrath under the darkness of the world and an enemy of God. And now you've been transferred and traded to the dominion of light to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the kingdom of heaven and spread the light of the gospel. And you know, as well as I do, when you transfer teams, there's animosity from the other team captain. The other coach don't like <laughs> trade. You don't believe me? Go ask LeBron James. When he went to South Beach after Cleveland, Ohio, right? Do you remember what they did to LeBron's jersey? They burned it in the street. Like, like, don't you ever come back. You're not even welcome here. They had a short memory when he moved back to Cleveland and won them a championship. We're like, we love LeBron, right? And then he left them again. But anyway, th th this is the point. This is the point. We understand that in the sports world. We fail to see that in the spiritual realm. Friends, you have to understand, we have an enemy who is opposing us everywhere. He hates us because he hates Christ. Now, why am I belaboring the point? Because I don't want you to be surprised as a follower of Jesus when the attacks come. One of the things in this world that is destroying the American church is the feel-good gospel. You've heard this before? Listen, if you just give your life to Jesus and walk an aisle and sign a car, your life's gonna be, e it's, it's gonna be a bed of roses. It's gonna be so easy. In fact, if you give your life to Jesus and follow him, you're gonna fame and fortune. You're gonna be rich beyond your wildest dream. Everything's gonna be simple from that point on. Here's the problem with that false gospel. That is not what Jesus just said. What did Jesus just say? Hey, listen, let me give you the real. If you follow me, it's gonna probably get progressively worse. You're probably gonna be embarrassed. You may be persecuted. Some of you are gonna be ridiculed, imprisoned, and some of you are even going to die for the gospel, for a good thing. But here's the thing, don't give up, why? Because I have a reward for you at the end that even if you knew about it and understood it, you still wouldn't believe it. Now, why is that important? Write this down. I want you to get this line. Good and evil. Here's what he's showing us. Good and evil. This is all through the Bible. It's all through your life. Good and evil run on parallel tracks and often arrive at the same time. Say that again. Good, and, this is how the Bible works. Good and evil run on parallel tracks. And if you look in the distance, it looks like they come together. They arrive often at the same time. This is why Paul said to Timothy, oh, by the way, who is pastoring the church of Ephesus, 28 miles south of Smyrna, he said this to Timothy, everybody who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Really? Surely it's, he didn't mean all, he meant some. You know what that word all, everyone who desires to live a godly life, all, you know what that word means in Greek? It's an interesting word. It means all, it means everybody, it means everybody. So if that's the case, which we believe it is, then if everyone who desires to live a guy life will be persecuted, then maybe the reason you and I, and I put myself in this category, are not being persecuted for the faith we believe in, maybe we're not living the kind of godly life he expected. And brother, hear my heart. I'm not, I'm not saying, sister, that you go out and cause trouble. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that when you live unashamedly for Christ, you will cause trouble to a world that is living against him. Thomas Torrance said this line, it's a pretty cool line. He said, a church cannot be a true church without causing trouble. Do you believe that? Here's why. Everywhere the disciples went in the book of Acts, you, should, you could have called it the acts of the troublemakers. I mean, that's all they did. Every town they went to, they said they turned the world, what? 
upside down for Jesus. Let me ask you, as you look at the landscape of your own life, wherever you go, do you turn the world upside down for Jesus or has the world turned you upside down for itself? You know, I heard someone say, if you never bump into the devil, it's probably because you're walking in the same direction. If you never bump into the devil, which you will from time to time, it's probably because you're going in the same direction. Now, here's the good news, and I have good news for you. Satan has been defeated by Jesus on the cross, amen? And what that means is he can't hurt Jesus anymore. So what does he do? He attacks, listen, he attacks or hurts Jesus by attacking the people closest to him, which is the church. Think about it. He goes after and attacks the people who love Jesus the most, which is us. That's why he attacks us. Now, at this point, I know what you're thinking. Man, this is really not the message I was expecting today, Pastor Robbie. Really? I'm not gonna grow church and win friends and influence Sumner County with this kind of stuff, right? I mean, and really, this is the first day I brought my friend to church. You're gonna go preach this mess, right? Really? Looks a little discouraging, right? And, and honestly, if you're honest about it as a Christian, you would say, why would anybody wanna follow Jesus anyway? That's what you're promising, like worse, progressively more difficult, you're gonna be persecuted. Here's the, here's the thing I want you to see. If we just read this text as fa at face value, we miss the nugget below the surface. L listen, I was, so, I was so excited when I found what I'm about to share with you. I was, uh, on Saturday night, I go over my sermon right before I, I go to bed, and my son, I have a shed uh, in the back where I pray and spend time with God. And so Rig calls me, my son, uh, about like 7.30. He's like, Dad, what are you doing? I said, son, I'm in here having a one-man revival by myself. I was reading this, I'm like, I said, actually, it's a two-man revival. It's me and the Holy Ghost. But anyway, we're just like, like, I was so excited to share with you what I'm about to show you, and we miss it if we give up on the text right here, but I wanna show you something below the surface. Go with me to verse 10. Here's the point Jesus is about to make. Jesus is gonna show us that he is sovereign, this is the key, over all suffering. Suffering's true, you will suffer as a believer, non-believer even, but Jesus is sovereign over all of our suffering. Look what he says, verse 10. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Why would we not be afraid? Because it looks bad. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, circle this word here, to test you. That's the key word, to test you. And you will experience affliction for 10 days. Days. Now you have to admit, that number 10 is interesting, right? Like why 10? Why not 12? Why not five? Why not four? We know this from our study of Revelation, and I just kind of remind us that every time, and I mean every time, listen to me, every time we see a number in the book of Revelation, it always has a deeper meaning than just literal. Always, we know that. Here's how you look at it. Every number has, I believe, a historical, biblical meaning, and a symbolic meaning. And I'm gonna show you both of them in a moment. Uh, the number 10 means more than just 10 literal. In fact, I don't even think it means that. It could mean 10 literal days. I think it means more than that. And by the way, if that's the kind of paradigm we're applying to Revelation, for those who are really like dogmatic about certain numbers, let me just remind you, you have to, because of this, rethink every number in Revelation. The number seven, the number 1,000, and the number 144,000. Not just literal, but and you have to wait to the series to get there, but that's where we're going, okay? So here's the deal. In the Old Testament, pop quiz. Here we go, back in gates. Because some of you are like, really? Thousand year reign? That's another sermon for another day. But back in, okay, here's the deal. Where do we find in the Old Testament the number 10 connected to affliction to the people of God? Okay, think for a moment. It's a hard one. Where do we find 10 days connected to the affliction of God's people for a period of time, I'll give you another hint, in a foreign land, in a foreign land. Anybody know? Close, Daniel. Ezekiel is a popular book by John. Daniel chapter one. Turn there real quick, I wanna show it to you. Daniel chapter one, verse 11. And what's gonna blow you away? When I found this nugget, I literally, I'm gonna tell you, I was having, I was having a revival. I was like, man, it's right here. I've seen, I've read this before, I didn't get it. It's literally the same 
line. Watch this. If you're there, say word. Daniel's in Babylon, and he's being tested already about his faith in God to give in to idols. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, here's the line, please what? Test, same word, test your servants for how long? 10 days, 10 days, same line. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink, then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you're seeing. Here's what Daniel is showing us. Daniel's in a foreign land. He's in a similar situation. He's being tempted to bow down to idols, but but God is using him to show the people, don't fall down. If you don't give up, throw in the towel, you're gonna be vindicated by God. Now, why is this important? Because Jesus is saying to the church at Smyrna, coming close, he's saying, let me remind you believers, it's going to get more difficult. Testing will intensify, but don't give up. Just like Daniel didn't throw in the towel in the lion's den, just like the three boys thrown in the fire when Jesus comes in, didn't throw in the towel, don't give up. Why? Because I'm with you in the fire. May not see, but I'm with you. I'm with you in the lion's den. I'm with you in the persecution. I'm with you in your suffering today. That's what he's saying to, I know what you're saying. How do you know that? Here's how I know. Here's how I know. That small word I told you to circle earlier, watch this, two, two, I know what you're saying. That's pretty underwhelming. (laughs) Two, really, two? I think the ESV says in order to, in order for God to test you, okay? That word two in the language of the Greek language, here's what it means. It expresses the sovereign plan of God. Here's what God's saying. I am allowing the devil to test you. Now the word test is interesting. It doesn't mean like test, uh, like a pop quiz, doesn't mean like a final exam, ACT, doesn't mean any of that. Here's what the word test means, write this down. It means to prove, here's a better way. I love this. Or to improve. Improve. Here's what God's saying. You're going to love this. God is saying, I allow trials in your life. I send testing in your life to improve your faith. It has to happen. For you to be the man of God I've called you to be, the woman of God I've called you to be. Listen to me, Long Hall, if you're in a test right now, come in close. Testing is sent by God never to break you down. God's tests are always meant to build you up to the man and woman of God that he's called you to be. Now we know that from the Bible, why? Because God gets his best soldiers out of the boot camp of suffering, right? The ones he uses the most have been tried the most. And here's what he does. God uses your present suffering to teach you dependence upon him. And here's how it works. He's watching and he wants to strengthen you in the present trial to give you a fortified faith to push back on the next trial. That's how it works. Now you're probably saying, well, well, I'm in a test right now. It doesn't feel good. I get that. Let me just encourage you. As bad as the test is, here's what's cool. Every test has a time limit. I mentioned earlier that the number 10 has a biblical connection, but it also has a symbolic connection. Let me give you the symbolic connection. The number 10 actually means totality. Write this down. That's what the number of gematria means. Totality or uh, a summation, if you will, the summation of something. You say, well, I don't know about that. Prove it. Here's how. Out of the 613 commandments in the Old Testament, which there are, God says, that's a lot to remember. Let me give you just a small group. Let me give you what? 10. And these 10 are a summation, uh, the totality of the others. When God wanted to give us fingers, he gave us 10. When he wanted to give toes, he gave us 10. That was enough, okay? So 10 in a sense, if it's the totality, here's what Jesus, I think, is saying by saying 10 days. Is it 10 literal days? Maybe, I don't think so, but maybe if you wanna go there, I think what he's saying is a time period. And by telling you it's 10, here's what he's saying, coming close. I am in control of your suffering. Pressure has a limit. Testing 
is terminal in your life. And although we may be tested to the limit, here's the encouraging part, there is a limit to God's testing. Now, unfortunately, we know this, sometimes testing leads to death. And some, as we know, in Smyrna, were tested to the point of death. But here's what Jesus says. Even if it gets that far, there are two promises awaiting you. And here's what he says. Be faithful. Here's the promise. Be faithful to the point of death. And if you are, I will give you, this is so cool. I'll give you the what? Crown of life. Let anyone who has ears listen to what the Spirit says to the church, to the one who conquers will never be harmed by the second Death. And here's the two promises. Unlike the perishable laurel wreaths that were given at the Olympic Games to the winners that faded soon after you got them, when you persevere to the end as a Christian, you have an imperishable crown that will never wither and never fade given from Jesus Christ. What a gift. What a gift. But more than that, watch this. This is so cool. He says the second gift is this. Prior to the cross of Jesus... Lock in for a moment. Prior to the cross of Jesus, the greatest threat that Satan had over humanity was death. Follow me, death, before the cross. Because death was the end. It basically, you lived, you died, and you were forgotten. But Jesus Christ came on the scene and disarmed the power of death by dying on the cross and rising from the grave and ascending to heaven to give us access to God and give us the promise of life tomorrow. And I don't know about you, that's pretty good news, right? Because Jesus conquered death so we wouldn't have to. And then here's how he says it. He says, listen, there are two deaths that every person if you're not right with God, we'll have to experience. Here, here's how it works. The Bible speaks of two deaths, write this down. There's a physical death and there's also a spiritual death at the end uh, uh, of eternity when judgment comes from God, when he sends unbelievers to a place called hell. That's the second death. The Bible in Revelation speaks of it four times, one in chapter two, one in 20, one in 20, uh, two in 21, okay? Now I know when you hear statistics, some of you are like, I don't know if I believe statistics. You know, 67% of people don't go to church. Or, you know, I've heard a, a guy say one time, I don't know if this is right, but he said 97% of statistics are made up on the spot. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that seems right. I don't know. Here's one statistic that's always been right and will always be right. You could take it to the bank. Look at me. Every person in here one day will die. Everybody including me, all of us are gonna die. The question is, are you going to die twice? That's the question. So, so here's how it works, write this down. If you're born once, you die twice. Born once, die twice. But the Bible says if you're born twice, you only die once. Here's how it works. Everyone in this room is born once, a physical birth. But if you're not born again, you're gonna die physically at the moment of death, but you're also going to die spiritually, the Bible calls a second death, when you stand before God and are expelled from his presence to a place called hell. Listen to me, put aside the fire, put aside the separation, put aside the isolation, put aside the gnashing of teeth and wailing and all the pain, put aside that for a moment. When you stand before God as an unbeliever, someone who didn't want God in your life, here's what God's going to say to you. You told me on earth that you didn't want anything to do with me, and so now, brother, I am giving you your wish for eternity. And then he says, it's time for you now to go to hell for eternity. That's if you're only born once. Now, here's the good news. If you're born twice, meaning you're physically born, but there comes a point in your life when you are born again. You may hear it this way, saved. The reason you don't, listen, this is so cool. The reason you don't experience a second death is because Jesus takes your place, because Jesus experienced death on a cross, because Jesus went into the grave, because Jesus conquered hell, because Jesus rose from the dead. When you stand before God, he takes your place so you don't die the second death because he already did. Hallelujah, amen. That's how it works. So the question you need to ask is, did you, Die, or are you born once or are you born twice? If you're, if you're born twice, you don't have to fear death. That's the 
That's the whole point of John's message to Smyrna. Why is that important? Because a man named Polycarp would hear that message when John wrote it. And John was very near and dear to Polycarp. I mentioned to you earlier, he was the Bishop of Smyrna and he was a disciple of John. Thank Paul Timothy, John Polycarp. Polycarp uh, was the age of 86 years old. The year was February 23rd, 1955. And uh, the town was abuzz with a, a public uh, game that was going on. They had the Olympic games from time to time and the games were happening and the people were, were in a frenzy and uh, they're walking through town and some guy spots Polycarp and yells out this line in the crowd, away with this atheist, you need to search him now. And the crowd stops and the authorities start to look and Polycarp who could have ran away and hid decided just to walk back to his post at the church and assume responsibilities as the pastor. The authorities eventually found him and they grabbed him. And this is a picture of Polycarp. And they went up to this older man and they started to bring him to the proconsul who was gonna judge his fate. And, and they said, listen, we don't wanna kill you because you've been here for a while and you're an older man. We're gonna give you a chance to confess allegiance to Caesar on the way to the arena. And so one of the guards is walking with him and he's basically pleading with him, he's begging him. And he's basically saying, why is it so hard for you to just not just say it? Caesar is Lord and offer a sacrifice to Caesar just to be saved. Why can't you just say it? And this older man said, well, because it's not true. There's only one Lord and his name is Jesus Christ. And as they drug him into that arena that day, Polycarp said, as someone was close by and, and, and wrote down before he passed, Polycarp said that he heard a voice from heaven saying to him these words, be strong Polycarp and play the man. That's what they said. And, and in today's terms, it would be like someone saying, like God saying to you, have courage, man up for me. And that old man stood before the proconsul that day and they gave him one last chance to confess Caesar and curse Christ. And, and he said these last words to this, this leader. He said, 80 and six years, I have served Jesus and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And the proconsul leader of the city threatened him. He said, listen, we're gonna burn you at the stake. You have one last shot to confess. And these are the final words to the proconsul. He said, he said, I love these words. You threaten me with fire that burns for a time and is quickly extinguished? For you do not know the fire which awaits the wicked in the judgment to come and in the everlasting punishment. Do what you will with me. And the seething crowd tied the elderly man up to a post and they put wood at his feet. They lit the flame and as the flames leapt up his legs, he said these last, it's crazy. These are the last words of Polycarp before he entered the presence of God. He said this prayer to God, oh Lord God, Jesus Christ, my savior, thank you for granting me the privilege to die for you. When Polycarp died, he was the 12th martyr in the city of Smyrna. Now, I know when you're hearing this, this, this is a little disturbing and it's bothering to you. I just wanna end with a promise and I'm gonna make you this promise. I can promise you today, if you're online in the chapel, I can promise you today a way to live free from trials and tribulations. I'm gonna promise you this. I can promise you today a path that has no suffering and no strain in life. Here it is. Don't ever fall in love with Jesus Christ. Don't you dare press into God for more. Don't you ever try to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live for Him. Don't ever speak up for the wrong around you. Stop fighting for injustice in our community and the world. Don't ever offend anybody with the gospel, God forbid. Don't ever post a scripture online. Don't ever preach a scripture at school. Don't stand up today for what the Bible says clearly in his word. In fact, here it is, settle for the status quo. Don't ruffle any feathers. 
Live like the world, go the broad way, go upstream. Everybody else is doing that and you will never experience pressure in your life forever. But here's the promise. If you live that way, I can promise you this, you will live a wasted life. A life without passion, a life without purpose, and a life of regret. But, but here's the flip side. If you dare to live for Jesus, what Jesus says is that if you live for me, here's the deal, it's going to be tough. It's gonna get progressively worse at times. You're gonna be persecuted for your faith. You may be ridiculed. You're gonna maybe be in prison as the world goes in the future and you may die one day for the gospel. But here's the promise I have for you. If you do that, you're gonna receive a crown that never fades and you're gonna meet a savior who never fails, who never fails. And so I wanna, I wanna leave you with encouragement today. Here's the encouragement. Do not throw the towel in in the middle of trials. In fact, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to throw yourself upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna ask you in just a moment to cast your cares upon the Lord, to bring your struggle to the Lord, bring your questions to God, to bring your pain to the Lord Jesus Christ and to bow down and let Jesus heal you. Let Jesus walk with you. So Andy and our worship team are gonna come out. And I'm gonna just give you an opportunity to come in just a moment. We're gonna make these steps an altar. And I'm just gonna let you come and we're gonna sing over you and I'm gonna pray over you. And maybe you don't need to say a word. You just need to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus and bring your anxiety and bring your worry and bring your sickness and bring your illness and bring your persecution and bring your broken marriage and bring your addiction and bring your hurt and your church hurt to the altar and let Jesus heal you with waves of the Holy Spirit upon your life. Would you stand with me as we pray? And as you're standing, we're just gonna, you're gonna adopt a posture of humility and prayer. And as you stand, if you just feel like, hey, pastor, you're talking to me, would you just make your way here for a moment? And we're just gonna pray, bring your brokenness, bring your pain, just bow your head for a moment. Let me, let me pray over you. And as I'm praying, you just come. Father, I'm praying right now that you would work in our lives. God, we know the first step to breakthrough is brokenness. And, and God, there, there are broken people in here because I know I'm broken. But it's when we acknowledge our need for you, God, that you fortify our faith. We don't have to fix it ourselves. We don't have to have the answers ourselves. We don't even have to have the reasons why we're experiencing this kind of persecution and suffering and trial and tribulation, but we know the one who holds the answers in his hands. And so God, as we begin to come, as we sing, God, would, would you just wash over us like waves? Would you envelop us, envelop us in your Holy Spirit? And God, I pray you show us that you're in the fire with us. You're not outside, you're not on the fringes, you're not on the outskirts, you're in the middle. You're in the middle of our lives. You're in the middle of this worship service. You're in the middle of our church at Long Hollow. You're in the middle of our country in this world. And thank you for being in the middle, we pray. In Jesus' name.